Hello, everybody. Virginia Opera is coming at you in your face with another season of We Hope. Interesting and attractive main stage productions. And uh, this season begins with another uh, phenomenon that the marketing people like to call first of firsts. That is, our first production is the first time that we have done that particular opera, a company premiere. Uh, a couple of seasons ago, in the 2016-2017 season, our first of first was a Kurt Weill, a collaboration with Bertolt Brecht, the last theater piece that he wrote when he was still residing in Europe as kind of a Pex bad boy, avant-garde type of composer. And that was The Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, we enjoyed that. I love it to death. I hope that you enjoyed it if you were able to come to that production. And so for this year's first of firsts, we are dipping back into the Court Violian well one more time with another company premiere, uh, Court Vile's American opera, Street Scene. Now, this may be not completely familiar to many of you. Uh, a lot of the students in the classes that I teach in opera appreciation have said they just don't know it. And you know, I, I know how it is with you guys. Uh, opera casual opera fans like brand names. You know, you look at our season and you see we're doing street scene that you've never heard of, and we're doing Madame uh, Madame Butterfly that everybody knows. Hardened criminals know about Madame Butterfly, uh, and so there is the temptation to think, well, how good could street scene be if I've never heard of it? The good ones are the famous ones, right? So I think I'll give that a pass and I'll go to Madame Butterfly. Well, friends, that is spiting, you know, biting off your nose to spite your face. You're really going to deprive yourself of the chance to become acquainted with a gem. And by the way, this particular opera has a very distinguished history. Uh, in case you don't know, for a little bit of historical background, it's based on a Pulitzer Prize winning play by Elmer Rice of the same name. Street Scene, the play, came out in 1929 and was awarded the Pulitzer for Best Drama. And the libretto uh, was uh, also adapted by the playwright uh, from his play, so it's going to be quite similar, uh, just a few more opportunities for operatic-type solos. And if that's not enough, uh, Kurt Weill's adaptation uh, debuted at the Adelphi Theater, uh, in New York, which is, by the way, a Broadway theater, not an opera house. And uh, that was in 1947. And 1947 happens to be the first year that the Tony Awards uh, came into being. And uh, Street Scene won the Tony Award for Best Score in a Musical. So we've got a Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony Award winning <laughs> uh, opera. And that should intrigue you. Now, both of those bring to bear on why this is a, a show that everybody should see. I'll put it this way. The fact that the score, and by the way, in winning the Tony for best score, uh, there was it's not like there wasn't any competition. Street Scene beat out Lerner and Lowe's Brigadoon and another classic musical, Finian's Rainbow. Uh, so some a pretty good achievement for this uh, naturalized American citizen, Kurt Weill. Uh, here's what I want to tell you. The beauty of the score, the entertaining value of the score, the craftsmanship of the music, is the reason why street scene should be produced and heard. However, it's Elmer Rice's original uh, script and his characters and the themes of this drama are the reason that street scene must be shown in the United States because uh, the social issues that are tackled by Elmer Rice in this story of life in a lower middle class tenement house with working class people in New York City, the social issues that he deals with are the very same social issues that are hot-button topics in 2018. It is not dated at all. And let me just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Turn to MSNBC or Fox or CNN or read your daily newspaper, and what is everybody talking about? Talking about immigration these days, aren't we? 
we're talking about uh, there's a certain politician from New England who has a stump speech about all the wealth being in the 1%. And how the workers and you know the wealth needs to be distributed more evenly. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. Uh, we have domestic violence as a hot button issue. We have a gun culture and gun violence as a hot button issue. We have calls for law and order. And then there's also the hashtag Me Too movement. Now, if you're not a you know, real conversant with social media, if that doesn't mean anything to you. I think, you know, the the parade of male celebrities who are shamed into retirement or, uh, you know, losing their jobs because of sexual assault. That's the Me Too movement. And those are the things we talk about today, right? Well, guess what? All of those are the themes that are discussed and brought to the forefront in street scene. It's absolutely amazing. And I'll illustrate some of those as we go through uh, taking a look at the some of the highlights of the show today. Now, as for the score, as I said, that's why you should be familiar. You must be familiar with with the drama because of all those social issues. It really gives us insight into our culture, our American society, and how far we may have come uh, with making social progress, but how far there still is to go. It it really has a lot to say to us. But the music is also uh, interesting. Kurt Weill arrived in America in 1935, uh, escaping the Holocaust and everything that was happening in Europe with the Second World War, and he was immensely grateful to find himself in New York City. Um, His reputation as the composer of the Three Penny Opera and the Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni uh, made him an attractive partner for many of the bright lights of Broadway. So he got to work with Ira Gershwin and Alan J. Lerner and Moss Hart and, uh, in the case of Street Scene, the playwright Elmer Rice and the poet Langston Hughes, that eloquent voice of the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, everybody wanted to work with him, and he was so grateful. He was grateful to have a second chance at a career in America and to be an American. And there is a sense in which the score, as I'll be pointing out today, the score to uh, a street scene is kind of a survey of what American musical genres were in 1947 when the show had its premiere. He takes a look around at all the leading composers of opera and Broadway and popular music in the America of the 40s, and he does homages. He he kind of gives you samples of all of these different genres and styles. So there is a great diversity in the music, and besides the American uh, references, there are also references or homages, if you will, to a couple of uh, traditional opera composers Puccini and Bizet, and we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, so uh, diversity is the key, and the reason for that is that diversity is really what the show is all about. Uh, we are in this, as I said, a tenement house uh, in uh, on East 65th Street in New York City. It's an actual building. You can look up the address, 25 East 65th Street. That's the building that Elmer Rice had in mind. The show is a bit autobiographical. Uh, The character Sam Kaplan can be taken as an avatar for Elmer Rice himself. He grew up in such a tenement house. And uh, like Elmer Rice, Sam is a young, bookish pre-law student who's intends to be a lawyer but is not terribly passionate about the law. The same was true of Elmer Rice. Now, a street scene is an example of American verismo, and these are its operatic roots. Uh, The story is about a woman who was in a loveless marriage, Anna Morant, who has been married for 18 to 20 years to hardworking, hard-boiled Frank Morant. He is a cold and uh, unaffectionate husband who constantly criticizes her. Anna is starved for affection. She no longer loves Frank. She takes a lover. Uh, In Act 2, Frank finds out about this lover. He kills uh, the boyfriend and also kills Anna. And this is what I mean by uh, 
American Verismo because this is the same plot outline that we find in several of the Italian Verismo operas of the late 19th century and early 20th century, including Mascagni's Cavalleria Rusticana, uh, uh, Len Cavallo's Pagliacci, and another Puccini opera that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a few moments. In all of those, uh, a wife who no longer loves her husband takes a boyfriend, the Husband has a quick temper, he finds out, and there is uh, murder and violence and tragedy uh, as the curtain comes down. So, uh, you know, the nineteen late 1930s, when uh, Kurt Weill arrived in America, this was part of the, the, the glory days of American musical theater. When you take a look at what was happening on the Broadway stage at that time. Uh, when Kurt Weill arrived in 1935, well, that's the year that Porgy and Bess opened, and he studied this opera and took notes and was very conversant with it. Uh, in the next several years, we had some of the giants of music theater operating in the prime of their careers, Rogers and Hart uh, producing The Boys from Syracuse and On Your Toes, uh, Harold Arlen, uh, writing the score for The Wizard of Oz in 1939, as well as St. Louis Woman in 1946. Uh, Pal Joey in 1940. Kurt Weill's first musical, Lady in the Dark, with Moss Hart and Ira Gershwin in 1941. Rodgers and Hammerstein, beginning in 1943, with Oklahoma, Carousel, uh, Allegro, The Sound of Music, so many others, uh, King and I. Uh, Irving Berlin in 1946 with Annie Get Your Gun. Uh, 1947, Lerner and Lowe, Brigadoon. Uh, Cole Porter, the year after Street Scene in 1948 with Kiss Me Kate. Do you see, the, the this is part of this uh, cafeteria of wonderful Broadway music that Kurt Weill is absorbing like a sponge and giving us references to in the uh, score of street scene. And I'm going back to that theme of diversity. In this tenement house, it's a melting pot, just like America was. Now, these days, when we talk about immigration, we talk about folks from Muslim countries, from Asian countries, and so forth. Back when Elmer Rice wrote his script uh, for uh, street scene, the uh, immigrants were the Irish the Germans, the Italians, and they were just as controversial. Uh, people who were not fond of immigration and didn't want outsiders coming in, they regarded them the same way some of um, some Americans regard uh, the current generation of immigrants to our country. And in this tenement house, you have all, the, you've got an African-American super named Henry, you've got uh, Swedish, you've got Italian, you've got German uh, and these clashes of culture uh, form part of the, the conflict that uh, makes the drama arise. Watching these people in this Petri dish of this lower middle class tenement house where they all have to struggle for a living, uh, it, it becomes the source of the tension and the drama that leads to tragedy and doom. So let's start taking a look at some of this wonderful music. Um, the music... As I say, think of going to a cafeteria, and you don't know what to what to get. There's the meatloaf, the roast beef, the ham, the baked chicken, the lasagna. Gosh, you just want some of all of it. And that's Kurt Weill's attitude towards all the genres that are popular in America. Uh, and not only just all those Broadway composers I named, but also the big band era, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Glenn Miller, all of those guys. So... To reflect the diversity of the cast of the opera, Kurt Weill is going to give us diversity in the musical genres that we hear in the score. Um, when the curtain opens, we're outside, we're on the front stoop of this tenement house, which is kind of a classic brownstone walk-up, and there are th some neighbor ladies, including a really nosy parker named Emma Jones, and uh, there's a terrible heat wave going on, just like the weather we've been suffering through in Virginia in recent weeks. Uh, high temperatures, high humidity, everybody's miserable. And the ladies are going to sing a little trio about, it's just so awful, this heat. And I don't know about you, but I hear a little Gershwin in this jazz-like complaint about the weather.
Now, these ladies are joined by the building janitor, an easygoing guy named Henry. Henry comes up, and, you know, uh, Henry has had a racial transplant <laughs> since the 1929 play. Uh, he was a Swedish guy uh, in the uh, Elmer Rice play, and I don't know, perhaps it wasn't uh, the, thought to be correct or proper to have an African-American actor in a principal role on the Broadway stage in the 1920s. I'm not so sure about that, but I know that by 1947, Elmer Rice and Kurt Weill and their African-American poet, Langston Hughes, were anxious to have a, a black person uh, represented on stage as well. So Henry is... Uh, uh, an African American, and uh, Kurt Vile was very interested in singing, have, uh, having a blues. He wanted uh, some African American style music as well. And Langston Hughes kind of took him under his wing and said, "Okay, baby, you just come with me. We're going to go into Harlem to my favorite cabarets and clubs, and you're going to hear, you're going to get this music in your blood." So Henry comes out and sings. A short little song in two verses. It's a blues. It's called, I got a marble and a star, he says, and the star's in my pocket, too. And if you're really good, I might show that star to you. So what do we know about Henry based on this music? Do we like Henry? Yeah, he's an easygoing, very likable guy. And is he very materialistic? Well, no. He probably gets paid all of $5 a week, I'm guessing, in 1947. And uh, so he doesn't care about things, about owning things. All he's got is a marble and a star in his pocket. Does this remind you of anyone? Can you think of another great character of American musical theater slash opera? Uh, A black fellow who's very likable and easygoing and doesn't care about owning very much of anything? I can. Oh, I got plenty of nothing and nothing's plenty for me. I got no car, got no mule, got no misery. The folks with plenty of plenty got a lock on that door. Read somebody's a going to rob him while he's out. Now let's just consider this briefly. So I think there's no question that Henry is an homage again to Gershwin in the character of Porgy. Um, Kurt Weill had the same overall goal that George Gershwin did of creating a musical language for opera that would be distinctly American. Uh, You know, Gershwin and Weill both feel we shouldn't be trying to turn out another Wagner, another Verdi, another Massenet. We need to have an American musical language that will be distinct and appropriate for drama. And Kurt Weill, also like Gershwin, had the idea of making opera more broadly popular and accessible. You know, back in Verdi's day, the beginning of his career, opera was not for the uh, elite. It was for the masses. It was a popular art form. And uh, Kurt Weill feels that America, that opera in general is becoming too much of a niche market, that it needs to have broad commercial appeal, and it can still be great art. So that accounts for some of the tone of the music of this opera. Now, I will point out that because there's a difference between Henry and Porgy, and it's this. Porgy is a complex, three-dimensional character who 
undergoes great dramatic development during the course of Porgy and Bess. By the end of the opera, he's essentially a different person than he was at the beginning. He's gone through a lot. He's killed a man with his bare hands. He's running after a, his lover who's a drug addict, trying to save her from the evils of New York City. He's not quite the simple man that he was. Uh, with Henry, it's a different thing. Henry is not one of the main characters. Henry comes out and sings this song, and then he goes back down into his uh, own apartment in the basement, and he has very little to do with the uh, main plot of the opera. He's a peripheral character, and he doesn't go through any uh, character development uh, in the classic way of drama. This is no not to throw shade on Kurt Weill, because the function of Henry's song is again to make one of the entrees on that musical cafeteria line, uh, uh, the variety, the diversity of the musical styles. We're sampling the different genres of music that you could find in America in the mid-century. And uh, another guy comes out and sings a musical theater-type song, Daniel Buchanan. Uh, you'll hear it. It's it, We don't need to hear every single number. Uh, so we start with some lighthearted music, the trio about how awful it is with the heat wave and Henry's blues and another lighthearted musical comedy. The song comes along about how uh, having a baby is worse on the husband than on the wife. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, now it's time to get down to the main characters. And in this sense, a street scene is almost like an opera within an opera. The uh, neighbors of the main characters sing in popular styles, music, comedy, pop music, or uh, blues, or what have you. But when we come to the Morant family, now the music is going to become, the orchestra will become more symphonic, the vocal lines will become more soaring and operatic and powerful, because now we're getting to the tragic tale of the Morant family. Frank Morant, a hard-working, working-class guy. Anna, his wife, who tries to please him but never can because all he has is harsh words and criticism for her. And their daughter, Rose, who uh, has never been to college. I suspect Rose is about 18, and she's a secretary in a real estate office. And Anna has taken on a lover. And everybody in the tenement house knows it. They all suspect. They're trying to figure out who her boyfriend might be. And even uh, Frank is a bit suspicious of his wife. Uh, and uh, then there's the other serious character is uh, Sam Kaplan, the young pre-law student I mentioned who has a just a terrible crush on Rose and uh, wants to... Uh, be a couple with her, wants a romance with her. So Frank's uh, entrance brings a new musical tone. Uh, it's like an opera within a musical comedy. And uh, we begin with a bit of... Uh, Frank's entrance is in the form of a melodrama. Spoken dialogue with the orchestra playing an underscoring, uh, such as you have in many films. And that's the definition of melodrama, spoken dialogue with a symphonic underscoring beneath it. Um, so here's our introduction to the uh, villain of the play, Frank. To be young like that. Evening, Mr. Morant. Good evening, Mr. Morant. Good evening. Some honey of a day. Have you been working all this while? rehearsing with lights in this weather and tomorrow I gotta go to New Haven with the rest of the crew for the tryout oh you're going to New Haven tomorrow yeah what about it why nothing well, I've got some cabbage and potatoes on the stove all I want is a good wash anybody upstairs no. well it's our playing and I guess Rose is working overtime. I never heard of nobody working nights in a real estate office. Well, the office is closed tomorrow on account of Mr. Gordon's funeral. He was the head of the firm. Never mind all that. She shouldn't be staying out nights without us knowing where she is. Well, she didn't say a word about not coming home, but... That's what I'm saying, ain't it? It's a mother's place to know what a daughter's doing. Things are different nowadays from what they used to be. Not in my family, and I'm 
different musical galaxy now, obviously more dramatic, more intense, more operatic. And, um, you know, one of the differences between music theater, musical comedy, and opera is that uh, the numbers in musical comedy are simply tunes. Their merit lies in their tunes. But with operatic music, uh, there's a lot more going on. The texture is more complex. And in that underscoring, uh, when Frank first came in, there was a a motive, a short musical idea, highly rhythmic in nature, that um, is going to symbolize the doom, the fate that's at work in the interactions in the Marant family. It consisted of a long note followed by four quick notes. Da, da, di, da, da. may have been hard to hear. You weren't listening for it. Uh, here, I recorded it on the piano. Here is that motive that is Frank's motive symbolizing the, the workings of fate and the doom of the family. <laughs> Da, da, da. Does that put you in mind? Those of you who really know your opera, here's a challenge for you. Quick now. Is there another opera that has a similar fate with a similar symbolism? Too late. Here's the answer. So this is one of those homages to traditional opera that I mentioned. That is not a coincidence. Kurt Weill is making a deliberate reference to um, to Bizet's Carmen and that particular motive uh, to signal to his opera-loving audience that, yes, this is a similar situation. This is going to end in tragedy. Uh, it's a little bit of a shorthand, a telegraphic bit of music, if you will. Well, Frank goes up to Wash and... Anna stays behind, and she's chatting about things with the neighbor ladies who are basically only wanting to interact with her because they want to find out for sure who her lover is. But uh, in the meantime, Anna has an aria. Uh, this is a full-fledged operatic aria. It's not a blues. It's not a music theater song. As a matter of fact, Elmer Rice and the producers of the original production of Street Scene begged Kurt Weill to either cut this aria or trim it, because it's quite long. It's over seven minutes. You know, the typical Verdi or Puccini aria is about three and a half or four minutes. So this is quite an extensive monologue. Kurt Weill said, no, I'm not changing a note of it. It's very important. And this is uh, one of the first climaxes or high points of street scene. Anna is going to manipulate we, the audience, into empathizing with her. We're going to find out why she has had to resort to taking a lover. She's starved for affection, as I said. And uh, in her aria, she expresses these thoughts that I, I want you to hear because I'm going to make a comparison. She begins, somehow I never could believe that life was meant to be all dull and gray. Somehow I always will believe there'll be a brighter day. Folks should try to find a way to get along together, a way to make the world a singing, happy place, full of laughter and kind words and friendliness on everybody's face. But somehow in the world I grew up in, the streets were dark with misery and distress. The endless daily grind was too much for them. It took away all hope of happiness. She says, when I was a girl, I remember I used to dream about a party dress to wear, but I never had a party dress. She goes on to talk about how she came to the big city to New York, hoping for romance, to find Mr. Wright for romantic happiness. And then the babies came, and life kind of settled down into a routine. And in the excerpt I'm about to play for you now, she says, I don't know, it, it looks like something awful happens in the kitchens 
where women wash their dishes. Days turn to months, months turn to years. The greasy soap suds drown our wishes. There's got to be a little happiness somewhere, some hand to touch that's warm and kind. And there must be two smiling eyes somewhere that smile back into mine. Here's the conclusion of this very impressive aria for Anna Morant. Days turn to months, months turn to years. The greasy soap suds drown our wishes. Not so much Gershwin. I don't know what you hear. I hear a little Puccini. Do you? With that intensity, with that uh, verismic, uh, uh, that vocal style very much redolent of verismo. And uh, I had mentioned that this is American verismo, and I had kind of referenced Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci, but there's another opera by Puccini that I think Kurt Weill has in mind here. Uh, one of the one-act operas that comprise his triptych, Il Tritico, is The Cloak, Il Tabarro. In The Cloak, we have very similar characters to Frank and Anna Morant. That's Michele and Giorgetta. Michele is a hard-working guy who works on a barge. He's a temper. His wife is no longer in love with him. She's having an affair with Luigi, a younger man. And <laughs> Giorgetta has a solo early in the opera that is a close cousin in the ideas expressed in Anna Morant's uh, aria. Anna was talking about life is dull and gray and it's all about dirty dishes and and when she was young she wished she had a party dress. Well, here is part of Giorgetta's aria uh, at the beginning of Il Tabarro. She sings, My dream is different. I was born in the suburbs, and the air of my Paris is life and joy to me. If some day we could give up forever our stupid, bleak existence. It's no life for a woman in this dark, dingy cabin. You should have seen the room of my younger days. <clears throat> uh, now look, uh, Kurt Weill did not write the libretto. The libretto is based on a 1929 play, and I read Elmer Rice's autobiography, and I see no mention of Puccini, Il Tabarro, or opera other than street scene. So in a sense, uh, Kurt Weill could not have had as his goal to recreate Il Tabarro in American terms. He, he's given a libretto, but we also know that composers have a hand in shaping librettos, and I believe uh, it's a credible theory that uh, Kurt Weill, who would certainly be familiar with all of Puccini's work, uh, he was a conservatory-trained, serious professional international musician, he may have tweaked this solo for uh, Anna in order to reflect the same kinds of ideas that Giorgetta expresses. I think it's another homage to uh, a previous opera. <clears throat> well, uh, when Frank comes back downstairs after washing up, he's about to go out to uh, get his drink on at uh, Callahan's Tavern. But first, uh, he's having a little discussion with the neighbors, and uh, he's displeased that his daughter Rose is late coming home from work. He thinks Anna is a bad mother and Rose is a bad daughter. And when the neighbors start uh, disagreeing with him a little bit and saying, well, you know, kids today. He says, I don't care about kids today. And he has his aria uh, in which he uh, expounds on the idea of things need to be the way they always were in the good old days. And here we find out how closed-minded Frank is to changing times. Look at these newfangled ideas going round. Love, divorce, and birth control. 
young girls smoking cigarettes, their dresses up around their necks, and men coming in, breaking up decent people's homes. But it ain't gonna be that way around here. You're here, you're here. Now you know everything you need to know about the Frank Marant view of life in America. Now, there comes a scene of spoken dialogue. There's a good deal of spoken dialogue in street scene in which people say, well, yes, times are changing and maybe you don't like it. But, you know, it's a great country. And uh, one of the uh, neighbors from the old country says, yeah, I mean, look at all the prosperity in this country. And that's when we meet a guy who is surely the grandfather of, excuse me, Senator Bernie Sanders. And this is the young boy Sam's uh, father. This is old Abe Kaplan. Abe reads the Hebrew language daily newspaper every day, and he is not so fond of how the United States does things. Uh, When one of the neighbors says, look, uh, at least we've got a lot of prosperity in this country. Out comes a Senator Bernie Sanders stump speech from Abe Kaplan. He says, yeah, well, there's money for the few. All the money is in the hands of the... the, the." He doesn't say 1%, but that's what he means. Uh, Just the people at the top of the chain. He says, sure, the rich are plenty rich, but upstairs... The Hildebrand family, there's a woman with three children who can't pay the rent, and our, these bourgeois laws in America gives the landlord the right to turn her out in the street. Frank Marant says, well, if you were to divide up all the money in the country in six months, it would be right back where it is now. And Abe says, who's talking about dividing money? We must start a new conception of money. We must put the tools of industry in the hands of the workers. Our laws must be based on human need, not human greed. This will require a social revolution. Ever hear any talk like that in our political discourse these days? Does it sound a little familiar? And this goes on to spark a very 2018-sounding debate about immigration because Frank goes on to say, yeah, well, we don't want no revolution in this country, see? I'm telling you it's time we put a stop to this kind of talk and the kind of things going on in this country. There's too many of you Bolsheviks running around loose. If you don't like the way things is run here, why don't you go back where you came from? One of the neighbors says, well, everybody has a right to his own opinion, Mr. Morant. Frank says, not if they're against law and order, they ain't. We don't want no foreigners coming in telling us how to run things. Mrs. Fiorentino says, well, it's nothing wrong to be a foreigner. Many good people are foreigners. I'm not saying they're not, says Frank. Uh, A woman named Shirley Kaplan says, it's no disgrace to be a Jew, Mr. Morant. I'm not saying it is. All I'm saying is we need a little more respect for law and order. If you foreigners don't like like it here, go back where you came from. This is (laughs) the views about immigration have always been the same. Everything old is new again. This is one of the things that we learn from this amazing opera street scene. And by the way, since uh, Abe Kaplan was bemoaning the faint of the uh, Hildebrandt family, here comes the Hildebrandt family. Now, tomorrow will be a bad day for them, but today they're very happy because young Jenny has graduated from uh, uh, downtown School of Applied Commercial Art, and she's wearing her graduation dress, and she's got her diploma, and it's wrapped in a ribbon and tied in a bow.
dared to hope in my heart that I was the best in the scholarship test of the Gillian School of Applied Commercial Art. I could hardly believe when I heard it. On you be most proudly bestowed. Yes, you ran, you know, a Gillian trophy. Wrapped in a ribbon and tied in the bow. Now, when he uh, was beginning to be active on Broadway, Kurt Weill said to one of his uh, co-workers that he felt his biggest rival on the Broadway stage was Richard Rodgers, Rodgers and Hammerstein. And, you know, this is another tip of the cap. This is an homage to Richard Rodgers that is absolutely in the style, not of Rodgers and Hart, but of Rodgers and Hammerstein. When I hear Wrapped in a Ribbon, Tied in a Bow, I hear songs like I am 16 going on 17. You know, the the fresh-faced, innocent ingenue. Uh, or maybe, when I marry Mr. Snow. So there's, uh, again, a bit of diversity and a bit of lightness after all the serious, intense drama of the Marat family that we've been experiencing before that. Uh, when uh, the... Uh, when everybody who's celebrating this graduation uh, goes back up to their apartments because it's nighttime now, uh, we need to meet the tenor lead of the show, that's Sam Kaplan, Abe's son, the one who is an avatar for the playwright himself, Elmer Rice, a rather unenthusiastic, unconfident uh, pre-law student. Sam uh, feels displaced. He feels He hates living in this kind of a slum building. He hates the roaches and the mice. He hates his life, really. He wishes that he could find the thing that will bring him happiness, and he feels alienated and alone. And he sings probably the best-known solo. Uh, We've all had that experience of being in a crowded city or a, a large city or a busy airport and yet feeling kind of lonely in the midst of all that rush of humanity. This is how Sam feels in New York in this crowded tenement building. He comes out and sings about how lonely he is in this lonely house. One of the, and listen carefully to the fusion here of operatic vocal writing with jazz-based harmonies in the accompaniment. Sometimes I hear a staircase And here I think Kurt Weill was extremely successful, uh, more so than any other number in this opera, at creating a new musical language for American opera, something that would fuse together, as I said, operatic vocal lines with a little bit more popular and a jazz-based accompaniment. That's a real fusion. This is something that I think Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim really paid attention to in creating their American operas. Well, we haven't yet met our uh, other leading lady, the second soprano role, Rose Morant. She's been working hard overtime at her um, at her office job, and she's been brought home since it's after hours by her boss, a real creep named Harry Easter. And here we get into another of these very au courant social issues that was a hot-button item in 1929, in 1947, and even more so today in 2018, thanks to social media, the hashtag MeToo. Poor Rose. 
She's attractive and young, and so everywhere she goes, men are hitting on her, abusing her, forcing themselves on her. Harry Easter pins her against the uh, bricks of the tenement house and says, give me a kiss. And she says, no. He says, yes. No, don't. People are watching. I don't care. He he takes her in his arms and he plants a big kiss on her and she's furious. She says, you shouldn't have done that. And this is life for Rose. Uh, a, a cab driver is going to come along later and do that. Uh, everywhere she goes, she's subjected to sexual harassment. Harry says, hey, we should just move in together. Let's get an apartment. You don't want to live in this rat trap. She says, well, what about your wife? Eh, she doesn't need to know a thing about it, says Harry the Creep. He says, you know, I got a friend in show business. I'll put you on Broadway. I'll give you the moon, Rose. And Rose sings her first solo. Well, you can maybe give me the moon, but what good would the moon be if I don't love you? I don't hear Rodgers and Hammerstein in that particular very seductive melody. Uh, I really like this song. I hear a different composer. I hear Cole Porter. Night and day you are the one Only you beneath the moon and under the sun Whether near to me or far it's no matter, darling, where you are, I think of you, night and day. The same kind of uh, urban, sophisticated, sliding by chromatic half-steps melodies in both of those. Uh, Rose is uh, musically a character who has her feet in both worlds, musical comedy and opera. When she's singing to uh, a, a supporting character, one of the lesser lights of the cast, uh, someone who sings in a music theater style himself, Harry Easter, then she responds singing in a low register, in the music theater soprano register that does not go into operatic extremes, uh, in a Cole Porter-type melody. Later, as we'll hear, she, when she's dealing with the tragic story of her parents in the Marant family, Rose will have operatic uh, aspirations, as well as when she... Um, has her uh, interactions with the boy who's hopelessly in love with her, Sam Kaplan. Um, they both had a rough day, and Rose is stressed and traumatized by the harassment that she's faced from her boss and from uh, another young man. And she says to uh, Sam, tell me that poem, that poem about the lilac bush that you read to me one day. I loved it. That lilac bush, to me, represents the hope for a better life, something beautiful instead of something tawdry. And so Sam sings Kurt Vile's setting of the Walt Whitman poem, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed.
And you see what I mean? We've gone from Cole Porter at least to perhaps Zygmunt Romberg or Franz Lehar operetta in this love duet, which also has a particularly lovely ending. Uh, Sam is afraid that nobody loves him, but as she bids him good night, Rose says, remember that I care. Act One uh, is going to come to a close, but not before we have one more example of a bit of hashtag Me Too and a bit of uh, sexual entitlement on the part of a young man. And that's uh, Dick McGann, who comes in with Emma Jones's daughter, May. They've been out at a party, and Dick insists on a kiss. May isn't really up for it. She has a wonderful line. What am I supposed to do? Hang out a flag every time some guy wants to wipe his mouth on me? And she submits to a very unenthusiastic kiss. She she doesn't want to be kissed. Frank, ins- uh, uh, Frank uh, Dick insists. And actually, when she sees him take a swig from his flask of gin, she says, well, give me some of that. And maybe we could have some fun. And after a little bit of gin percolates in them, they are both kind of revived enough to indulge in a jitterbug. This is an opera with a jitterbug. Moon-faced, starry-eyed, peach has a green with nuts on the side. I never knew there was anyone living like you. Moon-faced, starry-eyed, I'm gonna bust my best with pride. And who we got there? Maybe a little Irving Berlin. And then when they begin to dance, a very virtuosic swing dance, wait till you see choreographer Greg Ganakis's choreography for this moment, the orchestra bursts into big band era swing music. Count Basie, Glenn Miller, it's wonderful. Uh, but once again, we see that all the women are treated either to abuse, verbal abuse with their husbands or sexual assault and uh, inappropriate behavior from the men. And uh, uh, that's the hashtag Me Too. It's just amazing that these problems have always been with us. Nothing new has arisen on the uh, social landscape in the 21st century that hasn't been with us from the beginning. Uh, Act two moves rather quickly. There is less music because all the exposition has been attended to. Uh, The... Uh, the plot races towards its tragic conclusion like a kind of an out-of-control locomotive. So there are musical numbers, but there's mostly spoken dialogue. Uh, Frank, uh, it's the next morning. All of the action takes place within a span of 24 hours. It's the next morning. We still have our terrible heat wave. Frank is going to New Haven with the theater troupe for out-of-town tryouts. And uh, he's very suspicious at how interested Anna Morant is in his absence because he's wondering if she's going to have a boyfriend. Well, Anna has been seeing the guy who collects for the milk company, Steve Sankey, and uh, her daughter tries to talk her out of it uh, and say, please, everybody's talking. You've got to give him up. And when Frank leaves, uh, it's not without a, a little scene out in the street in front of the tenement house between Anna, 
Frank and their daughter Rose. Rose Rose comes to Frank and says, you know, Pop, things might be better between you and Mom if you were a little nicer to her. And she's, uh, Frank says, well, what has she got to kick about? I I never mean to her. I, I, I provide. I pay the bills. Yes, but she wants some kindness, Pop. And he says, ah, that's a bunch of hooey. I don't want to hear about it. And when Anna joins them, there is a trio in which the family tensions come to a boil. And Frank warns them, you better watch what you do because there's going to be trouble. Frank heads off to join the troop to get on the bus for New Haven. Anna goes upstairs to help the young mother she was speaking about. Daniel Buchanan's wife gave birth overnight, and she's sitting up with the, with the baby and the mother. And uh, Rose is left out on the street by herself. She's waiting for her boss to pick her up. They have to attend a funeral for an office worker. And Sam comes out. And he's been a party. He's listened to all of this. And he says, you and I, we should get out of here. We don't belong here. Let's start a new life. Don't you want to be with me? Don't you love me? Let's be a couple. We can go away together and start a new life. We'll go away together, just we two, just you and I. We'll build a house to shelter us beneath a happy sky. That's pretty good stuff. That's pretty inspired. And now uh, things get out of control. Uh, Steve Sankey comes by. Anna looks down from her open apartment window on the second floor and says, I've got to talk to you. Come on up. Right now? Yes, come up right now. Uh, I suspect that she wants to break up with him, but we'll never know because uh, Frank comes back. He's decided not to go to New Haven. Perhaps he's wanting to catch his wife being unfaithful red-handed, and he sees the activity up in there. Sam is unable to stop him from going upstairs, and there are two gunshots, and an ambulance comes, and two bodies are taken away to the hospital. You know, I don't know or care what side of the debate on gun laws 
you come down on in 2018 in the United States. Uh, but, you know, in Puccini's Il Tabarro, Michele killed Luigi, uh, his wife's lover. With his bare hands, he strangled him. Uh, here in America, uh, Frank uses a gun. And gun laws were in their infancy. There basically was no restriction on gun ownership in 1929. Uh, they were the most rudimentary kinds of controls. So, uh, you know, this is the difference between the two cultures. What a man did with his bare hands in Italy uh, in the early 20th century is accomplished with a gun in the in the U.S. So uh, we have this reference to gun violence as well. And um, Frank runs away. The police chase him. Eventually he's caught. Uh, the crowd uh, gathers around. The, the newspapers are there. They're taking photographs. The paparazzi are there. The people are lamenting the death. Frank is caught and led away in handcuffs. Uh, he asks Rose to take care of their uh, of Rose's younger brother, Willie. And uh, when the whole thing is cleared away and life is settling back down uh, with the incident over with, uh, now is the time that Sam says, Do you see, now you are free. Now you can go away with me. And Rose has an amazing moment. She turns out to be a very forward-looking independent, wise woman. She says, I'm not going to go with you now, Frank, uh, 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 Sam. We shouldn't be together now. The problem is that I can't belong to you and you can't belong to me. That's the problem that my parents had. My father thought that my mother belonged to him, that she was his property, and I don't want to be anyone's property. And she explains this in a final duet with the heartbroken Sam. belonged to herself, if he had belonged to himself, it never would have They're too young. They're too much grieving. It's not the right time to make a decision that will affect the rest of their lives. Sam doesn't yet have the maturity to understand this, but Rose does. She is an amazing character. She needs to figure out who she is and what she wants her life to be. But she's not closing the door on Sam. She says, who knows what the future will bring? Maybe the time will be right for us. In the meantime, remember that I care. Remember the lilac bush. Why isn't street scene more popular today than it is? Why is it so unfamiliar to many of you? Well, my theory is that it's a hybrid. It is a fusion, uh, and not completely a smooth fusion, of Broadway and the Opera House. 
And I think the contrast of the jitterbug number and the Cole Porter type number and the Gershwin type jazz with the more strident uh, Puccini-esque Verismo operatic passages is confusing for people. People don't like hybrids. They like something to be pigeonholed, something that you can categorize easily uh, so that you can find the right audience for it. But, you know, the, uh, the musical score is a banquet. I, you have to admit that there have been some pretty impressive excerpts that I played this morning, and we've only just scratched the surface. It's a marvelous score, and the dramatic substance of the libretto with the characters and how they interact, it is an encyclopedia of everything that is relevant to the United States of America in 2018. It has a lot to tell us. And you must see it, and I'm sure you will. And I'll see you at the Opera House.